Hey, Shalom. This is Rico Cortez from Wisdom Into Our Ministries. We are going to show a small little uh, uh, study. And for the full teaching, you can go to wisdomintoa.com. But I wanted to uh, present to you what I'm, pre uh, what I'm doing in regards to my Temple Location series. Uh, with, the, uh, whole, uh, um, with the whole understanding of the Temple from its foundation all the way to the buildings, all the way to the gates, the whole function of the temple. But what we're going to do here right now, we are going to focus only on the water supply on the Temple Mount. You know, many discussions are going on right now around the Hebrew roots of the whole movement in regards to uh, whether or not the Gihon Springs was the only source of water for uh, for the city of Jerusalem back in the time of Solomon, uh, at the time of Solomon and the time of the first, you know, uh, the first temple. Now, throughout the history of Israel, we know that everything expanded all the way to where the city was in the time of the first century in Herod, where the three walls came about. What I'm going to do, I'm going to focus about showing you how archaeology, topography, history, and uh, the, uh, the writings of the Mishnah and Scripture gives us the evidence that there was plenty of water on the Temple Mount. Now, we're not going to focus whether or not the Temple Mount only functioned for Fort Antonia. That's another conversation, which, by the way, we know now through history that they were both on the Temple Mount and Fort Antonia was not encroaching on the 500 by 500 area of the Temple proper, something that we need to understand. Many people, sometimes they are teaching things on the Temple without having the understanding of the Temple, the functions of the Temple. Okay, now we know that Matthew 24 says that Yeshua says not one stone shall be stand. He was in reference to the temple buildings. But today we're going to focus on the water. What I'm going to do, I'm going to do my best to keep you within a frame of time. And I'm going to show you certain topographic, topographical maps and show you how we can show you that the water was very much available in the time of the first century and that there was plenty of water for the services and all its functions, and the mikvah, and everything there, okay? All right, so let's get right into the topic. So it is water supply and cisterns under the Temple Mount. What you see here is a uh, topographical map of the Temple Mount. Many people study the, uh, the Temple, they never consider the topographical maps. They don't understand the expansions. The green area you see here is the expansion during, during the Herodian period. That happens much later. The yellow area is the area in question. That is the area where the temple once stood. If you notice to the north, you have what is called the Fort Antonia in the north. But in fact, that Fort Antonia later on, if you notice right in here, in this area, there's a fossil, which is a, it was a huge uh, natural, or if not natural, it was a way of protection of the original northern wall right here for its defenses. On the, on the west, you have the Theropian Valley. On the east, you have the Kidron Valley. And then uh, right here, you have what is called the Bethesda Valley or the Fosse. This Fosse here was 60 feet deep and 250 feet wide. And Pompey, the emperor, uh, the general Pompey, in the time of the Hasmonean family, he filled in this part of this area in order to come over the wall in the northern part of Jerusalem temple on the temple in order to conquer it. Later, Herod, he filled everything in and he expanded and built the walls that you see here on the north. So if we do not understand the expansions, we do not understand the topography, we're not really going to understand the temple and we're going to be moving it because we don't quite understand the location of it. And here the orange is the Hasmonean expansion. So clearly we see... The Solomonic, the Sol Solomon's uh, Temple, the original, uh, the original uh, measurement, 500 by 500. Nehemiah and Ezra, they rebuilt those walls. And then the Hasmonean expanded on the south. And then Herod expanded on the north, the west, and the south. So the western wall is not the original part of the Temple 500 by 500. Okay, with that being said, what you see here are now cisterns. I'm going to show you really quickly here. The, uh, the orange dots in here, we have 17 cisterns or 16 cisterns within the yellow area. Now, total, they're like 48, according to all the research. Who's done the research? Below the Temple Mount, this book that you see right here is very important. 
it was a uh, compile. It's a, a book that compiled all of the archaeology, all of the uh, topographical, topographical information found under the Temple Mount. I'm going to show you who did that. Also, also I'm reading from Dan Bahat, a renowned doctor and archaeologist in Israel. Also from Eilat Mazar. And her, fa her grandfather was Benjamin Mazar, the authorities. These are the authorities of excavation and archaeology in, uh, in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. Then we have Etzud Nexel, which he did an amazing job of uh, talking about the architecture of Herod. And uh, he tells you every detail about what Herod did and how he did it. Then we have these books in the bottom, the walls of the Temple Mount by Elat Mazar. That resource alone is $300. That resource alone. That's the most one of the most one of the most um, in-depth uh, archaeological findings around the walls of Jerusalem and the southern part, what they call the Ophel. Okay, now the other resource, the other resource that is really really important is called Measure the Pattern by Joseph Good, who's my temple teacher. Now Joseph, what he did, he did something really interesting. He took all of the topography, all of the archaeology, all of the history through Josephus. Uh, the letter of Aristeas. He also took the Mishnah, Tosefta, and the Talmud, and Scripture clearly, and he put all of those things together to come to a consensus where the location will be. Not just looking only at the Gihon Spring, because the, uh, the pressure of the water of the Gihon will not be enough to supply for all of the services and for all of the functions of the temple. Okay? And by the way, uh, Hezekiah, he took the northern part, the conduit, of the northern part of the Shiloach or the Gihon, and he redirected it south during the time of the Assyrians. You find that in Second Chronicles 30, verse 32, or chapters 32 or 30, verse 30, I don't remember. With that being said, I want to move on. I want to show you again, you know, the, um, the topographical map that is extremely important. Focus on the 17 cisterns inside the yellow area. Now, the numbers are a little different because there are two particular people who actually did the numbering system and I'm going to show you who they are in a minute. This is my main resource that has been uh, validated and this is not speculation. This is recognized by the archaeological world. One of the most important books that um, uh, Israel, Israeli guides use in order to be informed about the conduits and the cisterns under the Temple Mount. Uh, below the Temple Mount in Jerusalem by Shimon Gibson and David M. Jacobson. Now that system, uh, that book has been recognized by the PEF which is the Palestine Exploration Fund, which is responsible for all the major discoveries under the Temple Mount, dating back all the way from the 1800s, 1840s, all the way down to the early 1900s. Now, who did all this digging and going underneath the Temple Mount? You have researchers of the Temple Mount in the 1800s sent by the Palestine Exploration Fund. James Barclay, Hermit Pierriotti, Milchior de Vogue, Captain Charles Warren, the authority digging under the Temple Mount and also the City of David. You have Khan Rashik, a German uh, architect who actually has the most, uh, what do you call it, the most um, exact replica of a temple on the Temple Mount that he actually built himself back in the early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s. And also, he has a, uh, when you go to Jerusalem, you have all the information there that you can go see his model. Amazing. You have Condor, and you also, you also have Charles Wilson. Now, many of these were royal engineers of England. And you also have people who came to sketch out what they found. Now, the numbering system, this is something that people are not studying. They talk about the temple. They never consider the water supply or whether there was. Now, I'm going to show you without a shadow of a doubt here, ladies and gentlemen, that there was water for them on the Temple Mount. This has been verified with the archaeology. All right? So now, we have the numbering system. We have different numbers, but we are going by Khan Rashik. So W means Warren or Wilson, and the S means Khan Rashik, who did more of an expanding uh, measurement of each of each one of the uh, cisterns, these guys went in under the shaft that Warren dug, it, dug, it, dug in, and then he, they went in and they uh, surveyed survey the area. They measured it and they calculated the metric, uh, me, uh, 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 what do you call it? Metric cubics of, uh, cubic meter, meters of capacity of each cistern. As you can see here on your right screen, on the right side of your screen, 
you see a whole bunch of numbers. You are going by the Conrad Schick model. We're going to focus in only on a few. Okay, so what you see, all of those numbers represent either a cistern or a conduit in which the water will run through. Okay, so as you can see, there are many cisterns under the Temple Mount. So what I'm going to do is show you this particular map. It is a topographical map plus uh, a satellite picture plus you have on top of it the 500 by 500 where the temple buildings were and underneath the little blue area those are the cisterns underneath the temple mount and I was there in January and when I was there you can actually see the caps on top of those areas they're still there they're still using the water that was that is underneath the temple mount 40 to 50 feet underneath the bedrock okay now let's continue here's what we see we have a topographical map on the left and we have a topographical map 3D on the right now, if you notice, for example, with some of the cisterns, you see the depth on it. Now, let's get right into this. I want to give you some biblical evidence. I'm sorry, not biblical evidence, Mishnaic evidence of what the rabbis understood. And by the way, you have to remember, you have to remember that what I'm, re what I'm reading you here has nothing to do with uh, uh, tradition. It has nothing to do with, um, with assumptions. Actually, the writer of the tractate Midot in the Mishnah, okay, was actually there. He was a contemporary with uh, with the disciples. He was a Kohenim. He was a priest who lived in the first century during the time of Paul, during the time of John, James, and during that time. And he saw eyewitness and he wrote it down. And we still have witness of that. So what we have here is in the uh, uh, and the Mishnah tells us that the Gola cistern. The Gola cistern was located under one of the six chambers on the south side of the temple court. Now the Gola cistern was there and a wheel for drawing water was set over it. What's interesting is that it says, and from hence they drew water enough for the whole temple court. Mishnah Midot 5.4. It may also infer that rainwater was collected in the bed that Hamain. This is extremely important point of view, and I'm going to try to finish if I have the time to go on that. But we know that there were subterranean chambers, and they are uh, they are beneath both the Temple Mount and under the court of the Temple. And I'm going to show you that as we're going on. Now, if you want to know more about this, more in depth, we're going to please go to Wisdom and Torah, and there you're going to be able to see the whole teaching. Now, this is an eyewitness account in 985 Common Era of a Muslim. By that time, the Muslims uh, uh, already uh, dominated the Temple Mount. And he bear witness on the red box. It says, the, in the mosque area, there are 20, 20 underground uh, cisterns of vast sizes. That's one witness. The next witness is a very important one. Is the Persian Nazir-e-Kusra in, in 1047 Common Era. And the resources below the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, it says, The Persian Nazir il Khazar, who visited Jerusalem in 1047, provided the following account of the water installations of the Haram. The Haram is the Dome of the Rock. Below the ground level are numerous tanks and cisterns hewn out of the rock for the noble sanctuary. The rest everywhere, rest everywhere on the foundation of live rock. There are so many of these cisterns that whoever that however much rain falls, no water flows away to waste, but all are caught in tanks. Hence the people come to draw it. They have constructed laden conduits for carrying down the water, and rock cisterns lie below these, with covered passages leading down thereto, through which the conduits pass to the, land, to the tanks, whereby any loss of water is saved. The tanks that are below the haram are never need to be repaired for they are cut in the live rock any place where they have been originally a fissure or a leakage they have been solidly built that the tanks never fall out of order it is said that these cisterns were constructed by solomon peace be upon him so now we have a witness of a Muslim giving on, uh, giving honor to Solomon as the builder of those. I'm going to give you a few more, and I want to get into the other evidence. We have Muhammad Ibn Sham. He says there were many uh, uh, cisterns underneath the uh, Aqsa Mosque, and then we have Muthir al Gaharam, 24 water cisterns. And uh, we have a scholar in the 1496 that mentions 34 systems. So clearly, 
they have people who are on the Temple Mount who actually understood there was water on the Mount. Now, what you're looking at right now are the three huge pools of water that is called Solomon's Pools. The three large cisterns are called Solomon's of uh, the Pools of Solomon. And uh, in, in the east-west valley, about three miles, five kilometers southwest of Bethlehem, probably uh, actually dated from Hasmonean times. Now, why are these pools so important? Because these pools was the actual main water supply of Jerusalem. And I'm going to show you in a minute. An overview of Jerusalem's aqueduct system. Now, I'm quoting you from a uh, the website that you see below on the low right. It's actually by... Ash, uh, uh, Ashimai Mazar, which is a descendant of Benjamin uh, Eilat Mazar, okay? It says, an air photo of Solomon's Pool, the water supply system of Jerusalem, which rich, which reached its height in the late Second Temple period, consists of several independent but interconnected elements which were built, rebuilt at different times. It was explored in uh, and mapped by the 19th century explorers Charles Wilson and Conrad Sheik, and again in recent times by Amihai Mazar and others. The heart of the system in Solomon's Pools, three reservoirs which we descend in a stair-step fashion down the Artas Valley just southwest of Bethlehem. Now, what I want you to con concentrate here is that uh, it says they are monumental and quite astounding with a combined surface area equal to more than 400 football fields Sorry, more than four football fields, I apologize, and a capacity over a quarter million cubic waters. Now, on the right, you see the archaeological um, uh, evidence, and they determine the capacity of each pool. The upper pool can, uh, can provide up to 85,000 metric cubits of water. The middle pool can provide 90,000 metric cubits. Of water, the lower pool can provide 113,000 metric cubics of water. Now you are talking about now 228,000 metric cubits, which turns into 60 million 231 227 gallons of water, providing the upper city and the lower city. This is what you now see on the screen are the aqueducts that they built to provide the water to the upper city in Jerusalem and the lower, the lower aqueduct that will lead to the Temple Mount. Now, this is not including the water of rain, the rain water that were, that, that were collected. This is only what was constantly being pulled down. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, if you go to Jerusalem today, you can still see all of the aqueducts from these pools, okay? You can see it. You can go places, and they even have like a water station that you can go to. I've seen the aqueducts. Is there? Okay, I can't get to the Solomon's pools because it's now part of the uh, Palestinians. It will be difficult to get there. But you see, Amihai Mazar, which is the leading archaeologist in regards to this research, says the growth of Jerusalem in the Second Temple period and the massive sacrificial activity on the Temple Mount caused a major problem of water supply. The, first, the solution has been provided in the First Temple period exploitation of the Gihon waters, digging of cisterns under the houses, and the construction of large public pools no longer suffice. So they needed this construction. Herod, Josephus talks about this. Josephus in Jewish Antiquities, uh, book 18 says, and he, Herod, spent money from the sacred treasury in the construction of the aqueduct to bring water into Jerusalem, intercepting the source of the stream at a distance of 35 kilometers the Jews did not uh, uh, acquiesce in the operations of the involved. 10,000 of men assembled and cried out against them. But anyway, those were waters. Well, what you see there is verifiable archaeological information. Not an assumption. Okay, this is real information. I'm going to quote you only a few, particular few, cisterns. I'm not going to go into depth because I want you to go to my website and get the full teaching. And this is only going to be one, part one of the whole temple location. Now, this particular cistern is sheet number number three under the Warren Wilson numberings, number eight. Okay, it's actually on the south, on the center, on the south of the of the Temple Mount, and it's actually called the Great Sea. Now, Sheik estimates twelve thousand metric uh, cubits of water, which equals to three million 
three million seven hundred. I'm sorry, three million one hundred and seventy gallons of water. That's only one cistern. Okay. Now it's approximately the dimensions. The area dimensions is one hundred and twenty feet by ninety feet. Okay, now if we continue to get more information on this, it is estimated that this particular cistern can provide up to 2 million, according to Barclays. But now they, they, re, uh, they went back and looked it up, and now, later years, they remeasured it, and they found out that it can cover as much as, provide as much as 3 million gallons of water. Now, what you see on the screen is called the Great Sea. That is that cistern, okay? It's been actually sketched out. The Palestine Exploration Fund, they actually send people who can sketch out, and they send them with Conrad Sheik and Wilson and those guys, and they actually sketched it out. These are the cistern. This is the cistern that could hold up to 3 million gallons of water, if you see how big it is, about 50 feet underneath the Temple Mount. Okay, so we see that it's all there. Uh, this lies beneath the platform on the Temple Mount between the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome. And by the way, when I went to Jerusalem in January, I knew exactly where it is. You know, I go in through the south, through the west, and I walk up, and I know where sister number one, number two, they say the cost fountain today, which the Muslims use. Those were the bathrooms and the mikvaot in the first century. And then you look straight to the east, and right there you see the, the big sea. How do you know? Because they're capped today. They are capped today. You know exactly what every cistern is. You can count them all. Walk through. There's one, two, three. There's four. There's, there's 27, 20. You can see them all. Okay? Now, let's move on. Cistern number four. I'm only giving you a few. I'm not going to go into a huge detail because I want you to go see the teaching. Now, cistern number two. The height of it is 36 feet. It can provide up to 8,000 metric cubits. That's 2 million gallons of water. So now you have one cistern provides 3 million gallons. You have another cistern providing 2 million gallons. Now we have what? Almost 500, 5, 5 million gallons, 700,000 you know, gallons. 500, 5 million, 700,000 gallons. So we have now these two cisterns. The next one is cistern number 5, which is a little bit south underneath the Al-Aqsa Mosque today. Okay? And what you see, it even has steps going down. That one can provide up to 1,320,000 gallons. One cistern, 3 million. The second cistern, 2 million gallons. This cistern, another million and 300,000. They're huge. 30 feet high. 30 feet high. And they actually have steps. They found steps going down to it. Now, what you see here is a topographical map. And what I'm pointing to in the red arrow here is cistern 27. And why is this cistern so significant? Because cistern number 27, number 29, and 30, and 28, they are sitting underneath two important, three important buildings of the temple structure. If you do not know, if you do not know the temple buildings and where they were, where they were located, and the functions of every single one of those buildings, then you're never going to make the connection between the cisterns and the temple and the services. You have to understand the topography, the buildings, how big were the buildings, what was their function, where were they located. So let me show you how important this is. This cistern was 72 feet by 9 feet, okay? 72 feet long by 9 feet wide by 20 feet high, okay? Now, watch this. That cistern, which is number 27, the one on top of the screen, right here, sat directly underneath the chamber of the, leper, of the lepers. There was a mikvah there. And that's the one, and they found steps. Now, cistern number 29, right here, and 30, sits directly under this huge building that is called the Bet Hanitzotz. How do we know? They used to kill the animals on the north of the altar. And this was the place where they have to clean the entrails. They have to clean everything of the animals before they put them on the altar. Thus, we have plenty of water. One cistern is 32 feet by 9 feet, right? And the one on the south, this is the one on the north right here. And the one number 30 is the one on the south from here over there and there. is 60 feet by 49 feet. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a huge amount of water can hold in that. So let me give you another, uh, another way that you can see this. This is a map of, uh, map of the Temple Mount. 
Those cisterns that I just told you about, this is number 27. Number 28. I'm sorry. Number 27. Number 30. Number 29. And number 28. These are where the buildings would have stood. You know because of the different elevation. Topography, remember? Now let me show you what I mean. If we look at the building and the temple buildings, we have the, the temple buildings. You have Beit Hanitzot. That's in the north. You have the chambers of the leper, number 27. And then we have where they have the laver down in the south, Beit Aptinas. Very important type of functions. That's where you have the priest going to wash his feet and wash his hands in the evening. I'm sorry, in the morning before the service. That's exactly what is called the uh, the well. They had a they had a particular room. They had a wheel, and they used to pull out the water from underneath the fixed well underneath the big cistern that was in there. You have Beit Hamoket, and you have Beit Osrot here. If you do not know any of these buildings, then you're not going to understand the context of Matthew 24 verse 1. All right. So another map of the Temple Mount. You see the cisterns right in here. Now let's move on to the next thing. I'm running out. Of, I'm running out of time. So these are the same cisterns. Looking at it from the side, and then on top you see the buildings. And if you look down here, you can see the uh, topography and the elevation. This is the building, Beit Hanitzot, and this is on the court of the women. You see right here the elevation, and you know there were 15 steps leading up to the Nicanor Gate right there. So we see the the cistern right here with steps leading down to the system for the mikvaot. And these two cisterns were here that I just showed you early on the big buildings. Now, this particular last one that I'm going to cover, I just have enough time for this one. This is 50 feet below ground. This is number 28. And this is the most exciting cistern that we can find. And I'm not going to give you all of the information. I'm running out of time. But I want you to go to Wisdom and Torah, subscribe, and please uh, listen to the whole teaching. It's an hour and a half. You'll be able to, to really get a be better sense of what I'm trying to tell you. This cistern is located immediately under what the Beit of Tinas would have, be, would have been. Now, you see this particular uh, little leg coming out. That's a conduit. And that's a drain cistern from the water. And here you have what it would look like under Beit of Tinas. What they would do, the Sanhedrin Council was there. Uh, Lishkat Ha'etz, the, the chamber for the priest that he will go to on um, Yom Kippur. The Lishkat Hagasit, the chamber for the Sanhedrin council will be there. And also the Kior, which is actually the laver, was found in this building right here on the top, right on the south west, on the, uh, on the corner, on the, I'm sorry, on the northwest corner of the building, right in here. That's where the priest will go and wash his hands in order to officiate every morning. And if you see, let me see if I go to this one right here. If you see right here, when you go to the cistern directly, you see this little wheel over here? There was a fixed well immediately under that. And there was a wheel that would bring the water from the well up to the big bowl. And then a wheel on the building above that will draw the water from the bowl. And then that will cons consider that living water. And that's the water they would use. For the temple. So, so far we have what? We have one well, I mean one cistern, who provides 3 million gallons of water. Another cistern, 2 million gallons of water. Another cistern, um, 1 million gallons of water. The three pools of south of uh, Bethlehem, in which provided for the water for the upper and the lower city, directly to the Temple Mount, 60 million gallons of water towards the Temple Mount. You don't need that much water for, five, for 500 you know, soldiers of the Roman Empire. There's no way. Anyway, that's another conversation. I'll show you that later. But what we have here, this particular building, okay, Beit Aptinas, is what shows us. This cistern shows you the evidence that was, there was water on the Temple Mount. Let me see. I want to get to the point here. It says, it says this on the red box. The main passage has semicircular vaulted roof. But the branch on the east is cut entirely of rock. The floor is 40, 48 feet below the platform surface. The rock surface is 2,425 feet above sea level, clearly. Let me move on. So the former level of 10 feet below the platform level. Now, this is a very important part right here. It says, The modern name 
of this tank appears to be Beor et Rumen Rumane, or the well of the pomegranate. Sir Captain Warren places the altar of the temple over the northwest end of Cistern 28. In other, way, in other words, ladies and gentlemen, we have the evidence through archaeology that they know now where the, where the altar was and where the, where the well was. And they say the altar is right here and the well is down there. Let me show you how significant this is. Okay. In the, in the book of uh, Ezekiel 47 verse 1, it says, He brought me back to the door of the house. And behold, water issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house was toward the east. And the waters came down from under, from the right side of the house, on the south of the altar. If you do not study the temple, if you do not study the structure, if you do not know the names of the buildings, if you do not know the functions and how they did the sacrifices, that verse will make no sense to you. But when you understand the structure, the, uh, the geography, the name of the buildings, the function of each, of each building, the wells and the cisterns behind and under the Temple Mount, that you know exactly what this is talking about. The waters came down from under, from the right side of the house. That means on the east of the house. Okay? Yeah. And it says on the south of the altar. So you have the altar here. This is the south of the altar, which happens to be east of the house where the Nicanor Gate was. What happens to be the wheel, what happens to be the well, what happens where the priest will go in every morning and they used to officiate and they used to go get the water and wash their hands and feet before they officiate. Now let me leave you with a few more quotes and then I'll, I'll, we'll finish for this time. The chamber of the bowl, which is called Lishkat Hagola, had a well, bore, which from which water was thrown with a bowl, gagal, gadgal. This well supplied water to the entire temple courtyard, the Azara, the chamber of wood, Lishkat Hahaits, was situated behind this two. And it was the chamber of the high priest, Lishkat Kohen Gadol, right? And also called the called Parhedron. Now, this is called the Mishneh Torah, Chilkot Beit Ha which is Mishneh Torah. Now, remember, this was put there by the evidence of the eyewitness of the temple service. This guy's never really studied that. The, the Rambam never really went underneath the Temple Mount. You follow what I'm saying? Now, it's interesting that this information was written many thousands of years before Warren uh, and uh, Conrad Sheik and uh, Wilson and all those guys dug under the Temple Mount to find these. So now we have the evidence that tells us about this. Now, in the last quote from the Talmud Babli, Yomah 31a says that when they're talking about Yom Kippur and what the high priest had to do on Yom Kippur, it says that he will go to immerse himself in the northern building one time and then he will go down uh, to the uh, to the Lishkat Palhedron, which is south inside Beit Aptinas. Now it says, Rabbi Abayah says, we infer therefrom that the Itham well was at least 23 cubits above the ground of the temple court of the Azara. That means that now we have an eyewitness telling us that there was a well underneath Beit Aptinas. Very important. All the information lines up. And now we have the last one on the Mishnah. I don't have time to really go deeper than this, but I want to show you Mishnah Midot 5.4. And remember that who wrote this Mishnah was there, was an eyewitness in the first century. Mishnah Midot Mishnah Midot 5.4 says, the office of the exile, or the office of the Gula, there was a permanent cistern, and a wheel was placed on it, and from there did they draw water for the horde, for the whole courtyard. So now, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you this. If we're going to use someone's research, if we are going to propagate the temple, you cannot use information that has not been validated. Owe it to yourself to do the research, to validate this, to look at the verified archaeological voices who can put everything in writing and all the evidence is there for you to see and compare. What have I done? What my teacher has done. He connected all the available information, the topography, geography, the history, and the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, biblical and also rabbinical evidence to show the whole overall view 
and the whole understanding of whether or not there was well, there was water supply for the temple service on the Temple Mount. The Gihon Spring, as much water there was for the city of David, it could have never been enough water to function the whole temple service and to supply water to over the 200,000 people that would go up to the Temple Mount during the high holidays. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Remember, do not believe anything I say, but verify everything we say. But if you're going to verify it, make sure that you do it with the proper resources so that now we can honor the Father. This is the house of my King. And please, stop moving things that doesn't belong to us. This is holy ground. The mountain is completely holy. That's what Ezekiel 43, verses 10, 12 says. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And this is a short version of Did You Know for our studies of the temple location. Go to wisdomandtorah.com for the full teaching and the full explanation. Shalom.